So thank you, Lori, for organizing this amazing panel, and thank you, amazing panelists. Um, back in 1990, long before Liz Lemon, I worked at 30 Rock, writing for a boss who's more eccentric than Jack Donaghy. Uh, in many ways, it was a great job. Having to churn out a page of pitches for the top 10 list every day was like taking a master class in joke writing. Kids today don't understand. They've got Twitter, but back then it was all we had. So late night shows are still a wonderful springboard to careers in comedy or just a wonderful career in themselves. That means writing for late night shows is an important opportunity that should be available to any talented individual who's crazy enough to want to do it. Um, so le let's turn to the people who are actually doing it. And I think I just called you all crazy, sorry. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to kick things off by asking about um, comedic influences while growing up, what shows made people laugh. Um, and we were going to start with, I guess, Molly McNerney, who is the head writer at Jimmy Kimmel Live. Hi. Thanks for coming on a Friday night, you guys. Um, my first comedic influence was Johnny Carson. And I remember his last show, May 22nd, 19, 1992. It was the same night of my eighth grade graduation. Is that me that's whistling? No, that's outside. Um, that's my father. <laughs> Up my right, too. Oh, I know. Sorry, old kid. Um, uh, yeah, I loved him, but honestly, and we were talking about this before. That's going to spill. Um, we... <laughs> I, <laughs> I loved him, but I had no desire to write for Late Night. I just was captivated by him and his show, and I remember running home for my eighth grade graduation, skipping the party to go to my friend Katie Klein's house to watch his last show, and I remember crying. And um, I loved him, but I didn't realize till much later in my life that I wanted to do that. I didn't know that he had writers. I thought he just stood up there and well, made it all you, up. What did you want to be when you were younger? A Smurfette. <laughs> Turns out I am, because I'm one of all boys, <laughs> just like Smurfette. Um, now, I, d I wanted to be a veterinarian, like most girls. Um, and then my mom was like, you have to kill the dogs. So, <laughs> scratch that one off. Um, yeah. And, and, well, Rachel, you were saying that you didn't have TV in your house growing oh, up. Oh, yeah. No, we ha I mean, we had a TV, but I wasn't, I was allowed to watch, um, Family Ties and, um, Marty Stauffer's Wild America. So, I, I basically watched... Same, the same show. Yeah, effectively. Um, so, yeah, so I knew about, like, gazelles, and I had a crush on Michael J. Fox, so that was basically it. But if, sometimes if I played my cards right, I could stay up, um, late enough to watch the top ten lists on Letterman, and that was... That was um, pretty cool to get to see. But no, I didn't want to be a writer. I mean, I didn't well, did, think Did about anyone that. on this panel grow up wanting to be a writer? No. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do it, does anyone still want to be a writer? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, Larry, what did you watch growing up? Oh, I watched everything. I was a TV junkie. Um, and by that, I mean I would uh, shoot tiny televisions <laughs> into my arm. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's very bizarre. Um, I just watched it all. I, I had the TV guy memorized, you know, I was just in love with television. It was just something that I just, I don't know, it was just part of, of my entire life when I was young, you know. But um, I always love people like, Flip Wilson was one of my uh, first influences. Um, he was just so funny to me and I remember trying to, to imitate him and that kind of thing when I was young. And well, he had that wonderful variety show right. in prime time. Yeah. yeah, which they just, they don't have anymore. But, no, the Flip you know, Wilson Carol show's Burnett. been off the air for 40 years now. Yeah. Yeah. It was canceled in the early 70s, I believe. Yeah. And yet the, net the <laughs> network still hasn't officially canceled Right, it. right, there you They're, go. They've still got a whole... That's how they do brothers. They just leave them hanging for a while. <laughs> After they're dead, apparently. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and we, it's not we, so nice. But we, had some, uh, we have some Woody Allen fans too, right? Uh, Beth, oh, yeah. you... Yeah, Woody Allen is a huge influence on me. But um, the funny thing about, I just was thinking about something. When I was in third grade, I met this kid in my class, and he told me his father wrote for Mary Tyler Moore Show, and I love the Mary Tyler Moore Show. And like, he brought tickets into me, telling me I could go to the Mary Tyler Moore Show. And I remember like having these tickets to the Mary Tyler Moore Show, but you can't be under 16 or something. But it was such an odd experience, you know what I mean? 
being so young, but that was a huge influence. Mary Tyler Moore, and then Johnny Carson, I would come home. And Mike Douglas show, that's, you know, dating. I would come back when I was really young, and I would have, like, barbecue potato chips and sit and watch the Mike Douglas show, <laughs> like, when all the other kids were out playing. So I guess maybe... I never thought about it, but I really love talk shows. And now I'm on one. So in his autobiography, Born Standing Up, Steve Martin recalls the first joke he uh, wrote for national television. He was working on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, hour and the joke was, um, it, is proven, it, is, it has been proven that more Americans watch television than any other appliance. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in the book, and I find this fascinating, he also admits that he did not write this joke himself. He borrowed it from his roommate, Gary Mule Deer, who, who I've actually worked with. <laughs> um, but does anyone remember the first joke they got on TV? I do. Um, I was freelancing for Jay at the time, non-Writers Guild member at the time, so just letting you and it was, I sent it in, and it was uh, a story about that they put ants on board the space shuttle and they all died, which proves that space is no picnic. <laughs> <laughs> but that was That's the first one I got. I watched at home in Florida, and I heard my joke, and that was extremely exciting. Or, or bit, just it doesn't have to be one joke. No. I only remember the things that were rejected. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a true writer. <laughs> Steve O'Donnell is here, who was um, the head writer of the show when I worked there. And as a writer assistant, I remember saying, we should go out on Hollywood Boulevard and do Hollywood Boulevard shuffleboard. And, um, <laughs> which meant someone went outside and the guests would play shuffleboard on the Hollywood stars. And it was exactly as it sounded. It was terrible. <laughs> and it was boring. And I cried. <laughs> I don't think that was such a bad idea. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> you, Beth, you haven't spoken yet. Beth Sherman. I was really influenced by uh, stand-up and not watching it, but uh, old records. I, my mom loved flea markets, and we and we would go and to entertain myself. I, I got a few, and I was fully influenced by that. Um, they what, all, did you listen to Monty Python? And not Monty Python. It was Carlin, Cosby, Alan Sherman, who is unfortunately no Alan relation, uh, <laughs> Tom Lehrer, yeah, uh, Tom Lehrer, and all that stuff. But apparently, I, I, they always watched Carson. It was way past my bedtime. But apparently, as a baby, if I woke up uh, before midnight, I was my father's responsibility to feed... <laughs> And he would watch Johnny Carson's monologue. So as a baby, I was regularly fed. My mom said, God bless it, you always did. <laughs> so my, mother, my dad would feed me to Carson's monologue. Aw, that's sweet. Aww. Um, comedy albums, too. That's what, when we were growing up. I mean, like you said, Car Carlin and Joan Rivers and Steve Martin and everybody. You would all yeah. gather around at the parties where your, their parents had the albums, and then you got to hear all the dirty comedy albums. <laughs> and that was, that was really a fun thing to do. And everybody would m memorize it and come back and repeat it in school. And same thing with SNL when you'd watch SNL at the beginning. Nobody had TiVo or DVRs at the time, and so... Uh, you, you'd come back and you'd say, oh my gosh, did you see this and that? And, and so that was a huge thing when we were growing up was the comedy albums and Saturday Night Live, which was a big deal too, and um, early Letterman. Also, uh, Carol Burnett. Yeah, I yeah, love Carol huge. Burnett. And uh, she also did a monologue up top. If I, I think people forget it because they just remember the sketches, but she did, she did mono, so <laughs> she was a motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. In my opinion. <laughs> Um, so now let, let's move forward to, um, you know, the, the shows you're on now and, and uh, take us behind the scenes and maybe we can just uh, talk about what your favorite part of your daily job is and, and uh, what your least favorite part of your daily job is. And I guess we'll start with Lori. And um, let's see, I, uh, I mostly work on the monologue. Uh, Where do you work? I, I work at Conan and uh, Team Coco, yeah. So uh, it's myself and four uh, guys that mostly do the monologue. And so we're kind of sequestered in our uh, offices. We don't do much with the sketch writers uh, for a couple hours. And we just write as many jokes as we can. Um, we meet with Conan a couple times um, during the day. I guess the most fun part is, is from 3.30 to 4.30, because that's where we all meet and put together the final monologue. And 
it's uh, Conan and Andy Richter and Mike Sweeney, the head writer, and it's it's really like the funniest hour of my life every single day. They're they're so funny and rude and hilarious. <laughs> I wish you could all be there, <laughs> but it's 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 a lot of fun. I have a I have a great time. Even even on a bad day, it's you know you just you know, you're gonna write some turds. <laughs> some days you're just gonna be really off, and that feels crappy, but. Um, that yeah, it usually goes away the next day if I get more than six hours of sleep. So. Yeah, that's okay. good. Um, my least favorite part of the day is when my alarm goes off in the morning, and um, no, of your job, not the day. <laughs> no, I yeah, no, but in the morning the alarm goes off, and that means I have three hours to pitch. That our pitches are due by 10:50 a.m. Uh, at Jimmy Kimmel Live, and. Um, that's stressful. You're hoping that Tiger Woods fucked somebody, or that <laughs> I know that that Sarah Palin and yeah, some NBA Palin player got together dumb. years ago. But that's very stressful for me. Waking up and that alarm goes off, and laptop goes up, and eyes are still kind of closed. And you, I go to Huffington Post and Perez Hilton and CNN, and I'm hoping that someone fucked up somewhere, and <laughs> kind of feels bad. Uh, but I love the pleasure of making people laugh and I love um, when something people connect with it and they laugh and then it gets online the next day and people are saying nice things and yeah that's the high and the low. Beth? Oh hi. Um, let's see I'm on the Tonight Show and I actually don't write monologue jokes. I've tried a couple times they haven't been accepted. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm just not funny. But um, I do a lot of the bit pieces, so I do a lot of the sketches, and um, so like the Magic Clerk, um, I came up with that idea, and I went to the Magic Castle, a friend of mine performed there, and I thought, hmm, magic, and mm -hmm. just someone normal, that would be fun. And so you go in, and you have to write it up, and then you sort of pitch it to Jay, and then he hands it over to the head writer, and then you sort of go back. If they don't say anything, and you really believe in it, you can go back and sort of say, hey, what about that idea? And, you know, they'll come around if it's a good pitch. And, um, and they've let me, the nice thing about it is is that they've let me um, really uh, take my sensibilities. I used to work on Jimmy Kimmel and, you know, and I feel like the stuff that I'm doing on the show is really like my sensibility for my humor and not just for The Tonight Show. So I think that that's been really great. And, um, and it's fun, it's, you know, a lot of editing and then it gets on the air, and then you're on to your next one. Yeah, the next. That's about it. And, and Beth Sherman um, has worked at both Leno and Letterman and is currently a writer on Ellen. Um, and uh, I can't keep a job. <laughs> <laughs> You've been there. How long have you been there? Uh, this is my third season at Ellen. Yeah, that's very, very good. <laughs> Uh, well, this show is kind of different because this show, uh, I used to write some monologue, and I would do bits uh, primarily at, at Leno. Uh, but this job really, it's not topical. I used to always do topical stuff and let's see what Bush did today that <laughs> makes us cringe, but thankful. Um, yes. <laughs> sort of, uh, and uh, at this job, I mean, Ellen's monologue is very stand-up, so it's very much uh, a comics take on a particular subject. It's very much, um, you know, you should never go out to dinner with more than four people because when you get the check, this one does that, the other one does this, and this one, someone takes out the calculator. I mean, really sort of diving into a particular topic. So it's been a nice change. I actually left, Obama was sort of recently in office when I left Leno, uh, and I was kind of glad because he's, at least at the time, not as rich to comedy uh, as Bush was. And it seemed very difficult to do topical comedy, that, to do topical comedy, and I, I didn't leave for that reason, um, <laughs> but it's, it's sort of been a nice change to, to go to something that is more stand-up, uh, and then we also, but we do a lot of tape pieces and bits and things like that, desk pieces, weird products.